know not everybody was going to be able to, um, I'll adjust the recording for the conversation, but I know not everybody is going to be able to attend. Um, so we were going to uh, record it and let them see the recording afterwards. So for, for folks that just joined, we're gonna wait just a couple minutes and see if we get any more folks um, on the line before we get started. I know Steve wanted to get on, but I'm not sure whether he, he might have had a conflict. Yeah, we had a decent number of folks think um, think that they can get on. So I think I think we'll have a few more at least. So maybe wait one more minute. We'll just go ahead and get started and then folks can trickle in as they um, come online. Hello, everyone. My name's Sharon, as most everybody knows by now. Um, today is a special session of our Sustainability Commission meeting so that our architects that have been doing our facility condition assessments and energy audits can brief the Sustainability Commission. Um, to acknowledge today is not going to be a meeting where we make any official actions. We knew we were not going to have a quorum because a large percentage of the commission was going to have to watch the recording afterwards. Um, but this is, this is a high level look um, at our draft findings. Everything is in, in draft version at the moment. And what we would love to do is we're having a series of these meetings with a couple of different groups. And the Sustainability Commission is one of those groups so that we can kind of get some feedback. So near the end of the presentation, um, if you wanna take notes along the way, when you have questions, kind of jot it down because we do have a lot of information to share and we were hoping to focus on the questions at the end and we could always revisit a particular slide if we want to, but we would love to get questions, get feedback, all of that kind of stuff from the commission members so that we can improve the draft reports as we move forward and give them to other folks within the county and then also make them public on our website. So that's the only purpose for today is to go over the facility condition assessments. And so you're welcome to write questions in the chat or jot them down. We'll go over them near the end. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike um, and to get started. Great, thank you, Dr. J. Um, thanks everybody, thanks for giving us your time this afternoon. I am joined today by my colleagues from KCBA Architects. Um, Mike Kelly is a principal here, masquerading as Mike Thompson on Zoom. Um, <laughs> and Kausta chubuk from Bureau Veritas, who is our engineering partner on this project. Um, we are gonna go through uh, the facility condition assessment. We're also gonna look at uh, some spatial analysis today um, and talk about the energy findings um, that Bureau Veritas came up with as they were going through the buildings. Um, quick summary of the, the, the presentation you're going to see today. We're going to introduce you to the team. We're going to talk about how we approach the project. Um, the third part, we're going to talk about spatial analysis. Um, then we're going to cover uh, energy sustainability and capital planning. We're going to talk a little bit about analysis by the campus. And uh, finally, we're going to reach a conclusion towards the end of the presentation. Um, team introduction, as I said, um, we're joined by Vera, Vera Veritas today. Uh, Vera Veritas is doing a lot of the legwork in terms of the technical stuff. Um, they've evaluated a lot of the engineering systems, the mechanical systems, the building skins, um, and they've developed the facilities condition assessment that you're going to hear about today, as well as the energy analysis. Uh, as KCBA, we've been looking at a lot of the spatial uh, implications uh, around the county that your buildings provide. Um, so you'll be hearing from us about what we found as we were going through looking at the spatial usage of each building on each campus, um, where we think you might be short, where you think we, we might be over, um, et cetera. Uh, also on the team, we had Hunt Engineering, who is a civil engineer. They were responsible for helping us understand some of the zoning, um, some of the site challenges along the way. 
Uh, we had Global Corrections Group join us. They gave us some insight into uh, how correctional facilities run and operate um, and the unique needs that go along with that. And we had Arrow Real Estate Services join us as well. They gave us some insight into the value of each piece of property and what it could potentially sell for should the county uh, decide to put anything on the market, which we don't expect uh, or anticipate coming out of this report. And uh, right now I'm gonna turn it over to Calstep. He's gonna take us through um, some of the first sections. Actually, no. <laughs> I'm gonna take it. Sorry, I forgot we, we mixed up the deck. Sorry about that. Um, we're gonna start with a space assessment approach. Um, as part of the, as part of analysis, as, pardon me, uh, the analysis of the spatial conditions of the county, um, we really started out by analyzing a spreadsheet that was provided to us back in, I think, May of this year. Um, two spreadsheets, actually. One was payroll data from 2019. The other was payroll data from 2020. Um, the reason we had two payroll data is because 2020 was a bit of an off year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we really ended up referring back to 2019 and testing some assumptions on the 2020 data. Um, but that was only a piece of it. We still had to walk through each building along with uh, the Bureau of Veritas team. Uh, we were looking to see how the building was being used. We wanted to hear from the directors uh, about what their concerns were, what was working in their spaces, what wasn't working in their spaces, um, and just get, generally get a feel for things. Um, once we took the data from the spreadsheets, we started to apply benchmarks um, to the number of staff. Uh, and what that means is that uh, through research, um, the state of Washington in particular, and uh, also the GSA, General Services Administration, um, has developed sta industry standards for the amount of square footage that's required per employee for certain functions and uses. Um, so typically, we were able to take something like an office of 10 employees and add a factor of 215 square feet, net square feet per employee, which we're going to talk about next. Um, and net square footage is generally the space within your office. So from that finished wall over there to that finished wall over there, finished wall, finished wall, all faces within the office are the usable space within that office. We call that the net square footage. Um, a lot of this presentation, you're gonna hear us talking about EGSF or de departmental gross square footage. That includes other items and aspects, uh, wall thickness in particular, that's what you're seeing highlighted here, but also electrical closets may, that may need to squeeze into the space mechanical rooms, um, even, you know, other incidentals. And uh, finally, you're going to hear a little bit about gross square footage. So gross square footage really is the building itself. So the thickness of the exterior walls, uh, corridors running between office suites, large mechanical rooms, stair towers, elevator shafts, all the other stuff that goes into making the building function vertically um, and mechanically um, and making it succeed. To get to DGSF, we have to apply some factors. Uh, again, these are benchmarked factors. Um, so we're going to go, we, we apply these to the NSF that we've already established based on multiplying those NSF benchmarks by the number of staff. Um, DGSF allows us, again, to account for these walls and the other incidentals within the space. The lower the um, factor for DGSF, the more efficient the space is. So for an archive or a storage space where everything is thrown up on shelves and everything's kind of crammed into a corner, you're gonna see a higher uh, efficiency factor. Um, for large spaces like a judicial office where there's a conference table in the office, uh, where there's a lot of books, uh, a library, uh, other incidental spaces that lawyers typically would need to use or a judge would need to use a chamber, you're gonna see a higher factor. That gets us to the EGSF. And then finally, for the purposes of this study, we're adding one more factor to get to the building gross square footage of about 1.2. These are percentages, by the way. So um, 1.2 is a 20% factor tacked on to the NSF that we've already seen. And that's gonna be combined with another 20% factor going from DGSF to GSF, typically. So after we figure out the benchmarking and what the county actually needs versus what you have right now in your existing buildings. We also have to then project out and understand what you're going to need in 2035. 2035 is where the county's uh, current comprehensive planning documents end and project out to, which is why we're looking out to then. Um, within those uh, comprehensive plan documents and the land use framework policy, 
we noted that the county at the time they were produced in 2015 was expecting a population of 569,982 residents by 2035. But with the census that just came out this year, we're realizing that that might've been a little off. Um, the newest census that came out just about a month or two ago uh, revealed that Delaware County now has a population of 576,800 residents, which is a little higher than what was anticipated. So that puts us in a position where we're gonna have to now extrapolate uh, what the population of Delaware County is gonna be in 2035. Additionally, we need to consider job growth because it's not just the residents that the county serves, it's also the businesses and even the patrons of the businesses. Um, so that same study, previously the land use framework noted a anticipation of 5,000 jobs added by 2035 in the county. And what we're seeing so far based on the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission employment forecast reports is that you're going to exceed that. Um, back in 2015, there were 268,000 jobs occupied in Delaware County. In 2035, DVRPC is projecting 276,000 jobs. Um, so it's a little greater. It's more like a 8,000 job growth than a 5,000, but pretty close. Um, taking all those together, we have to uh, extrapolate. We project out um, the growth factors. We come up with the delta, which we then divide, and we develop this uh, percentage of growth. We look at, like I said before, both residents, um, which has a growth factor of about 4.8%, jobs, which has a growth factor that's a little lower at 2.25%. And then finally, we did a combined residents plus jobs, which brings us to around 4.02%. That's just reflecting all the growth between the two categories. And when we project out and try to understand uh, what your staffing needs are going to be, by 2035, we typically use this one the most often because you have many functions in the county, notably law enforcement, but there are others that are going to serve anybody in the county, not just the residents of the county. So a Department of Health and Human Services may only serve the residents of the county, so we would apply this factor when projecting their staffing. Um, but, you know, the Sheriff's Department, we would apply this factor if we're talking about um, having them serve everyone in the county. And going through that process, we found that there would be about 140 um, jobs created within the county by 2035 based on the growth patterns that we're seeing today. There are a couple exceptions on here or notes that we're gonna get into a little bit later on. These moving targets that you see here, um, these are dependent on either the inmate count at the prison or the bed count at Fair Acres. Depending on how those fluctuate and how those change over time, they will influence the number of employees and staff that the county has on hand at those locations. And Kalstub, now if you want to take it away and tell us a little bit more about your aspects. Okay. Nice, nice work over there, Mike. That's very Thanks. interesting. So, uh, uh, Mike, so you will be driving over here. So, uh, let's talk about the energy sustainability and capital planning. Uh, so. Our understanding of the scope over here uh, was uh, as a part of the, cap the whole master planning exercise, the county really wants to know where they really stand in terms of both long-term capital planning, uh, uh, as Mike talked uh, earlier about what is the manpower requirement, is the space sufficient, right? But at the same time, also understanding where your current buildings stand in, in terms of needs. Do we have enough funding to keep them standing, right? Are the buildings energy efficient? Are they going to be meeting the goals of the future where uh, it's envisioned that the world is going to be more energy efficient and water uh, conscious? So uh, the goal over here, the big picture goal was to bring all these three things together. And as part of the study, the way we approached it is we always start with a uh, pre-survey questionnaire, pilot program, and uh, we created some draft reports for the county, uh, which uh, on approval, we started doing the site visits uh, for different uh, groups. So Mike, you want to click on the next slide? Yeah, so uh, next, okay. So. Uh, as part of the facility condition and energy assessment, we started looking at the different aspects of the building. The, the way we approach it is everything that the county is responsible for in order to uh, uh, keep up with upkeep of the buildings, to make them habitable, to make them uh, 
uh, occupiable. Those are the things that we look at and what things have been taken care of, what things are required over the next 20 year horizon so that the county can start planning uh, monetary amounts for each one so that they are not blindsided by any certain expenditure. So as part of that, we look into both um, if the building is worth keeping or not, right? So that analysis is completed by something called as a facility condition uh, index, FCI, which kind of gives you a breakdown of uh, on a scale of one to 10, how bad your building or how good your building is, right? So that it has is excellent, good, fair, poor, or it's like, it's not really worth keeping it, depends on what are your immediate costs. So we'll talk more about that in the future slides. Next slide, please. So the approach over here is phase one is we understand where the buildings stand, both from an FCA perspective, as well as from energy perspective. Energy perspective, we start benchmarking the buildings, understand what is your energy source intensity for it. From FCA perspective, we start understanding what is your, what are the prior capital programs implemented at the site? What are the planned projects implemented at the site, right? Phase two is where we start doing field assessments to gather information from the site so as to comprehensively um, collect information and tabulate it in a capital plan, as well as um, understand the energy and water saving opportunities at each site. And the phase three is where all the things come together and we start tying a report together, which can be useful and can be used as a, uh, as a medium for developing a capital plan for the county in the long term. Next slide. <clears throat> So let's talk about benchmarking. Benchmarking is where we pick up all the data. The county has, has an agreement with a private firm which uh, buys utilities for it. It hedges it in advance. And so uh, through that medium, the county is uh, able to procure uh, energy, both gas as well as electric at a very advantageous rate as compared to uh, other counties uh, from, by hedging it in advance, right? So we are able to procure that information from the county. We're able to benchmark it. We were able to push a lot of the data into Energy Star Portfolio Manager so that the county can keep track of their consumption and also come up with the different emissions for each of the sites. Next slide. So the field assessments when we comes to energy, right? Once after we are done with the initial phase of benchmarking, primarily focuses on identifying means of reducing the energy use at the site, right? So we tend to focus on the five fundamental things, the HVAC systems, lighting, plumbing, envelope, and controls. So the goal over here is to uh, get a holistic understanding of how the buildings are performing, what are the things that uh, are interacting with each other, and what can be tweaked so as to uh, come up with a proper demand reduction plan so that it can be implemented in a cost-effective manner and the results can be achieved from it. So that was a big picture goal for us. And in order to do that, next slide. In order to do that, keep going. So in order to do that, we, we started conducting field visits, right? So uh, the field visits consists of uh, the following few slides are going to show you how the field visits go by. So we start with doing the site work it kind of, uh, it's a nice cool graphic over here that shows what exactly the site work uh, includes. Everything that's outside the main structure of the building, right? Followed by the envelope, uh, which in essence means wall, curtain walls, any defects with it, any issues with the walls. These are the major capital investments for a building to, and capital repair items for a building that are required for upkeep followed by the roof and membranes uh, and other aspects. So these are the different things we look for and at the very end, we look at the interiors of the building where we capture anything that's related to energy or the long-term capital needs for the building. Next slide. Uh, ultimately, the energy savings are tabulated in, an, uh, in a table which is easy to understand and uh, provided to the client. The critical item is the savings to investment ratio, which kind of tells if, it's, uh, if the recommended measure is cost effective and it's financially feasible or not. You can go on to the next slide. So let's look at the portfolio wide findings over here. Okay. Uh, the energy audit that we conducted at the sites, we identified over 63 different measures, totaling around $3 million of initial investment, about half a million dollars of first year uh, cost savings through both energy as well as operation maintenance costs, 
yielding in a simple payback of around 5.8 years, right? So this is a big picture thing. Now of that 3 million, you can clearly see a bulk majority of that was lighting improvements. So the county stands to invest up to around $900,000 into lighting. Controls is the second biggest chunk. HVAC is, sorry, HVAC is the second biggest and controls is the third biggest. So this is, these are the core places where we feel the county should be investing its money in, in terms of gaining energy efficiency. Uh, on the right-hand side, the bar chart kind of shows you the, the biggest bang for the buck is coming through lighting with almost $200,000 of annual savings followed by plumbing savings because Pennsylvania pays a, a relatively higher sewer cost as compared to uh, most of the other states. So there's significant amount of plumbing savings to be achieved. And these are typically considered as a low hanging fruit uh, projects that we strongly recommend the county to move forward with. Next slide. Uh, we also tabulated savings in terms of electric, natural gas, propane, and water. So the, the next two slides talk more about this thing. Uh, it, it just kind of gives you a breakdown of where the bulk of the savings are coming from. Uh, you will see that you're seeing plumbing savings in natural gas because there's savings to the reduction of domestic hot water use. But again, uh, the big picture to remember and take away is lighting and controls and HVAC are the three biggest uh, saving avenues over here. The number two oil savings is predominantly coming from uh, the Lima campus, uh, where the 911 center and juvenile detention center, these are the only two facilities that we had inspected that have number two oil. Unfortunately, we are not able to procure the existing uh, consumption for the sites, uh, but we are able to tabulate what are the potential savings by doing energy efficiency upgrades at, either, at both of these sites. Okay. Water is going to be a big, uh, big, big saver for the county. As you had seen, it's the second highest uh, line item that gives you the most bang for the buck. You, uh, the county stands to save up to uh, almost 6,000 kilogallons of water by uh, uh, implementing water saving measures, which are tabulated around the pie chart over here. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, these are the FCA, these are the energy audit findings. This is, we always say that energy audit is an uh, investment into a building, whereas FCA is a cost, right? What FCA comes up is what are the essential expenditures to keep the building standings? Energy is kind of optional. So it's ideal to marry the two things when you're doing any building upgrades. So as a part of the FCA, when we analyze the building needs, uh, we, we covered almost 63 different buildings with 2.4 million square feet. And we identified uh, approximately $104 million of capital needs over the next 10 years for the county. So a bulk majority of them fall under the Delaware County Courthouse uh, group. So we, we broke all the buildings into six major groups. So we have Delaware County Courthouse, then there's emergency services training center, George Hill Correction Facility and adjoining buildings within that uh, complex, the Lima campus, uh, the Fair Acres, the Chester City buildings, as well as the parks and rec. For this particular presentation, we have excluded the parks and recs, but $104 million of expenditure that we are seeing over here is predominantly for the first five groups, pardon me, the six groups uh, that are under consideration. Okay, of that $104 million, there's approximately $5.7 million in immediate expenditure, which tends to fall in year 2021 itself. Uh, of that, almost $1.1 million is the accessibility requirement in the courthouse campus area. Uh, around $1.8 million is for the envelope and structural needs for various buildings. Most of these buildings are at least 30 to 40 years old. So uh, the envelope definitely requires some amount of upkeep. Uh, there is amount, almost $700,000 of interior finishes work required, which consists of carpets, interior dye walls, doors, um, then ceiling tiles, et cetera. And uh, approximately $100,000 worth of site work needs that is required across the campus, which includes parking, paving, and uh, sidewalks, things like that, within the government office buildings, not just general street walks, but within the government office. So these are the immediate needs that the county is going to be uh, looking to, okay? Next slide, Mike. <clears throat> so let's talk about FCI. 
uh, as a part of this analysis, right, the, the, the key for Mike and I to bring in front of the county is let's look at all your buildings and try to identify where should the county spend the money first, right? Uh, if you if the county says who needs money, all the buildings will raise their hand and say they need the money. But this is a mechanism that independently says that let's look at the immediate needs for each and every building. That is all the systems that are broken or about to break, okay? Divided by the total replacement value of the building. And that ratio is called the facility condition index, FCI. So if the ratio is between zero to 5%, that means it's an excellent case. The building is really good. But if the ratio crosses 30%, that means it's in a really poor shape. That's when we say, okay, let's talk about potentially doing a gut rehab on the building, or we can talk about completely demolishing and rebuilding the building, uh, reconstructing a new building. And that's where Mike and his team is playing a key role to understand like what is the future, taking into consideration like the future occupancy and, and coming together like energy efficiency, FCI, as well as the planning is the key part for the county to move forward. Next slide, Mike. So in this one, the classic example is uh, the George Hill Correction Facility, which consists of a bulk of buildings. And it also has uh, an FCI score of almost 14 percent, which is pretty bad, right? Comparatively, it's uh, bad. It's, it's slightly skewed over here because it takes into consideration the old prison as well, which falls under the jurisdiction of the county, uh, which uh, needs to be toned down. But the, the second oldest building is the Old Chester Courthouse, which has a lot of needs, but it's undergoing renovations right now or is undergoing a plan. And then comes Thomas Curran Building, which is the third uh, building with the most need right now. Okay, next one. So this is a 10-year summary. What the 10-year summary tells that in a scenario where county decides not to invest a single penny into any of this building and just keep the buildings running as it is. This is the situation where it will be. Like the courthouse complex, the Thomas Curran building is going to be the first building to uh, reach its end of its useful life at, uh, because it's, the, it's a small building, but has a lot of needs to it, right? Uh, followed by the 911 center, which we can talk more about it in the future slides. And as the graph shows that this is kind of the dire state, what happens if the county is not able to fund uh, investment into these buildings. Next slide. So let's do an analysis by campus. Uh, Mike, you want to uh, give an introduction from space analysis perspective for each one? I think you're on mute, Mike. Still on mute. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kasta. All right, we're going to start today with the Delaware County Courthouse campus first. Um, for those that aren't familiar, although I'm sure most of you are familiar, uh, the Courthouse campus consists of five buildings, um, the first of which is the Courthouse building, DCC1 as we've, we've labeled it, um, followed by a government center, the government center parking garage, um, front field building, and then the current building. These tally up to about 711,000 gross square footage of, of building but only roughly 341,000 square feet of that is, is used. And a part of that uh, discrepancy in the ratio there is really because the parking garage is, isn't really usable building space per se on the courthouse campus. Um, we, going through the payroll data, we noted that there's approximately 1,350 employees working on the campus. And we estimate that by 2035 with the growth in the region, uh, you would need space for about 1,530 employees. Um, the current utilized DGSF, as we just looked at on the previous slide, is about 341,000 square feet. Based on the benchmarking and industry standards that we took a look at and we multiplied through, we actually found that you need roughly 372,000 square feet. And then extrapolating that and extending it out to 2035 to take into account growth in the county, it really grows to almost 381,000 square feet, giving you a a delta between what you have now and what you need right now of about 39,455 uh, gross square feet. If we want to look a little further than who lives on the current campus, um, then we have to start talking about who's leasing space within media itself. 
And within media, we found approximately 150 employees occupying leased space off the courthouse campus. Presumably they were in uh, either the toll building or the Sweeney building at some point. And when we lost those, they were moved into to leased office space in the borough. Um, the 154 employees represent roughly 57,000 uh, square foot of, of need um, for additional office space on the campus, which tallies out to a, a delta of about 96,000 square feet um, for the courthouse campus, should you decide to move those in leased space back onto the courthouse campus itself. Um, a couple of notes on that. Um, these are only, only applying to headcount, but there was a previous study that noted a need for six new uh, court sets, which based on the growth, we suspect is probably accurate. Um, and there are other departments located throughout the county um, that are outside of media that may also want to come back into uh, Media Borough itself. Most notably is, uh, is Planning, uh, who's housed in uh, Middletown. Actually, they're split in two. So one half is in Media Borough, that's community development, I believe. And then the rest of the planning office is out in Middletown, right on uh, Route 1. Uh, but there's also library services uh, in Building 19. They're not leased, but maybe they can come over to this campus as well, since they're an administrative function. Um, and you do have human services both in Eddystone, which is leased, and you also have human services in Upper Darby, which is a significantly larger office, but is also leased space. Um, and then on top of the, the council meeting room may want to be enlarged just to account uh, a, a larger public as the community continues to grow. Custom. <clears throat> so the courthouse complex itself has $104 million of needs that are uh, coming up over the next 20 years. Uh, of the bulk of that, 41 million are uh, related to the interiors, which means uh, that the buildings itself are pretty old. The courthouse is uh, an old building. Along with that is the government center, which requires significant amount of interior work. We have Thomas Curran as well as Frontfield building over there. Uh, all the three buildings, as Mike has said, they are packed to uh, the max capacity. And as a result, the interiors, um, the interior finishes are uh, getting a blunt of it. So uh, clearly for around $41 million of initial investment is required. The second biggest item is HVAC. Uh, HVAC is around $21 million. Uh, predominantly because we have two very old boilers that are uh, servicing all the four buildings along with the garage itself. Uh, so the boiler, one of the boilers is past its useful life. It's still running and so it is being utilized, but uh, we strongly recommend uh, splitting the HVAC system into uh, independent uh, hot water, high efficiency condensing boiler system that serve individual buildings with the exception of the courthouse itself, which might require a steam system uh, for the future as it's, it's an inch, it's an historical building. And so uh, a part of that uh, would mean that you might have to do a demo of the interiors uh, to update the system to hydronic system. So the key part is there are challenges in just upgrading the system from going to a steam system to hydronic system. And so the courthouse might have to stay on the steam while the other buildings uh, would be, it would be more efficient to have a dedicated HVAC system for each building individually, right? The next biggest item, the, sorry, uh, let's look at the FCI. You can switch over, right? So the next chart over here is the FCI, right? Over here, let's look at the individual buildings. So the courthouse, we are looking at around $244,000 of just brick pointing work coming up in 2021. This is the envelope work that we talked about earlier uh, on the big picture, like the buildings getting old, uh, requiring needs. Currently, as you can see that the FCI index is close to 8%, so which is false in the fair category right now, but it might uh, soon uh, exceed if there's no further investment than in the facility. The red color line shows an uh, escalated FCI, an abated FCI rather, which means that in a scenario where you don't invest money, this is where you would end up, right? Uh, you, one thing that you will, is there an option for demand water like tankless and solar? Yeah, we, we can answer that shortly. So uh, 
the the government center does have solar system in it uh, and i'm going to say a vast majority of energy for the government center is generated by solar right but now it has to be remembered that you if you decide to go for a solar hot water system you will have to do a centralized domestic hot water system that serves all the campuses on top of that there is a full fledged cafeteria in the government center that requires dedicated hot water supply at a very high peak capacity uh, and so what we realized that it will be prudent to have high efficiency gas fired water heaters um, to service most of these buildings whereas the office buildings it would might be useful to just uh, serve them with an at point uh, hot water heater uh let's look one of the common features that you'll see across all the four thing is the high ada cost that uh in in all of them right there was a recent report from the justice department and we incorporated all the findings into this analysis and as the as the needs suggest there is a lot of ada improvement which has to be done at the facility which is which takes a high priority over anything else uh the garage has a fire suppression system that requires some attention over here Uh, it also requires the ada ramp as well as a concrete flooring repair work that is required okay so next slide the the last one is the thomas curran building that we focused on early on uh, probably one of the smallest building on the campus over there but the building with the most needs over there right uh, it is again uh, packed to its max capacity uh, but the hvac system and other system interior uh, surfaces as well as the lighting systems require a lot of attention and investment to make it more efficient so uh, there is a cost for upgrading elevators over here for 103000 and our understanding might correct me if i'm wrong but it is it's already under progress right elevators have been upgraded right now right correct yeah so that project is uh, underway right now so next slide <laughs> let's look at the energy perspective right uh when we look at the courthouse complex uh, there are five buildings there's a single electric meter two gas meters serving the whole campus there is a main gas meter that serves the boiler room and there's a secondary small gas meter that serves the generator in the courthouse for practical or practical purposes we ignoring the small uh gas meter serving the generator uh, whereas this analysis takes into consideration the electric generation from the solar panels then um, the electric uh, consumed from the grid as well as the gas consumed from the grid right and uh, <clears throat> based on that we have done an analysis for this facility we have identified almost a million dollars of different applications and energy and water saving measures a bulk of that is again lighting controls is a probably controls is the largest one over here with almost half a million dollars followed by lighting uh, upgrades and hvac upgrades hvac upgrades primarily are consisting of having individual boiler systems controls is to have a complete retro commissioning done across all your buildings so that the air handling units and other systems are uh, performing in optimal manner and lighting upgrade is uh, switching over to led across the board uh, the biggest bang for buck in terms of saving is plumbing because as we have been saying the buildings are packed to the max so plumbing use is the max in this building so if you have high efficiency or low low water consuming plumbing fixtures you're going to get the most bang for the buck okay next slide please so this is a slide which kind of expresses things in like site eui like where do you stand and this is the best way of uh comparing buildings like for courthouse complex we're looking at around 60.33 kbtu per square feet which is definitely on much higher end uh and uh, based on all the other measures that we have recommended we are showing around uh, around 7 million kbtus or 7075 million uh, btus of energy savings which results in around 3538 metric tons of co2 offset per year right also equivalent to like 764 cars and around 804 acres of pine trees planted and just just kind of a way of presenting the data of what kind of environmental impact can one complex 
result into by investing a million dollars in uh, making energy efficiency upgrades at it. <clears throat> next slide, Mike. So next is the fair acres. Yeah, thanks, Kelsto. Um, so fair acres is in Middletown Township. It is uh, on a larger tract of land that the county owns over 200 acres of land. Um, and it is the collection, probably the most dense collection of buildings that the county has with uh, roughly 20 buildings on the site. Um, it functions primarily as a skilled nursing facility, but it does have some odds and ends on it as well, that we'll get into. Um, right now, there is an estimated current workforce based on the payroll data, again, of about 712 employees. Um, but estimating that out to 2035 is a little, a little tricky because that uh, staffing count is really based on bed count. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute here. Um, the current licensed bed count for the campus, uh, because skilled nursing beds have to be licensed with the state, the current count is 874. And what we're not really sure about is where they're going to go uh, by 2035. So looking at things right now, uh, we see a, a delta of about 74,000 uh, departmental gross square feet. Um, actually, this would be NSF, uh, 92,000 DGSF on the uh, campus itself. Uh, as, in terms of uh, residential beds on the campus, there are four be buildings that have uh, beds within them. Oh, sorry, five. Uh, building number one over here has 70 beds in it. Building number five has another 41. Um, and those are all clustered over on this wing, actually. Uh, this is all leased out space. Six is uh, fully licensed to the county. That's 124 beds. Uh, seven is another 123 beds. And building eight, which is the largest building on the campus and also the newest in the county inventory, um, has 516, giving you a total of 874 licenses. Now, building number eight is right now currently under construction. Um, when that work is done, it's a renovation project on the 10th, 11th, and 12th floor, converting skilled nursing rooms into uh, uh, short-term rehab rooms, still the same licensure process under the state. Uh, you'll end up with 847 beds rather than the 874. So what does that mean? Well, the beds translate roughly into space. So if we're eliminating 27 beds and each bed equates to roughly a 600 square foot need for space, NSF need, um, that translates to a, an easing of, of need for space of about six 16,200 square feet um, on the campus just on that one project alone. And from talking to the Fair Acres staff, um, we've learned that there are other plans that might be in the works to try to reduce that number even further. Um, so the first thing that we had learned about was uh, this notion to pretty much lease out building number one, or at least convert its use from skilled nursing to an adult daycare, which then uh, doesn't require the licenses anymore from the state. The problem with building number one is that it has central quarters that are six feet wide, um, and those are generally acceptable because they're grandfathered, but they're not preferable in terms of um, running a senior living practice. In fact, um, CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, who um, has all the policies in place that the nursing homes has to follow, uh, really requires an eight foot wide corridor for any kind of new construction or even renovated construction. So this building doesn't properly function um, for skilled nursing, which is why they're looking to maybe uh, eliminate these 70 licenses, which translates into a savings of about 42,000 uh, net square feet. Um, additionally, the county is talking about uh, getting rid of the licenses at building number seven and converting that possibly either into uh, another leased out space or offering some different type of senior living uh, housing on the campus. Um, and finally, another option that was floated was, was reducing the number of beds in building five in the single wing over here from 41, as it is right now, to 20. And the reason that doesn't change anything spatially is because right now the, the rooms in this wing, as well as a lot of other rooms on the campus, um, accommodate four residents at a time. So this, uh, this part of the building has 10 rooms, four residents each, and then there's one room that's a, a private room, but I don't think it conforms to CMS. Uh, so all told, if all those licenses were to be sold off and no longer in Delaware County's um, portfolio, that equates to a, a savings of about 134,000 net square feet of space, or, or at least an easing of the burden 
uh, for space. Um, so coming back to a slide that I already showed you before, what does that mean? Well, it takes that um, deficit and it turns it into a slight surplus uh, because we're losing two buildings in theory from the portfolio, assuming that we lease out building number one and assuming that we lease out building number seven. So we lose that square footage as it stands right now, but we also lose a lot of uh, needed square footage to make those buildings operate. So you end up with a differential of about 18,740 net square feet that benefits the county. So you can see why understanding the bed licenses and uh, understanding where they're gonna go by 2035 really kind of affects our analysis. The other consideration on the Fair Acres campus is Building 19, which is a, a unique critter on that campus. Building 19 isn't part of the senior living campus. Um, it is run by the county and it houses three very unique functions. Uh, the county's central archive, which we, we know is at capacity. In fact, it's so far at capacity that it's putting a burden on the courthouse complex because files and uh, bankers boxes are beginning to store up in the or, uh, courthouse buildings. Um, it stores the medical examiner's office, um, which has been in and out of use since the COVID pandemic started. Um, it's a little too small, not, not enough room for staff, not enough room for the refrigeration of, of bodies. Um, and uh, it sounds like there's some deficiencies with the autopsy space as well. So that's something that needs to be considered. And then library services is also in there. Library services has about 11,000 square feet of space to accommodate their 24 staff. Uh, when we walked through there, um, despite the fact that our numbers look like it should function in there, the space was, was crammed with a lot of uh, stuff. Uh, computers, books, signage, promotional uh, materials. So that space is going to have to be looked at from a storage standpoint as well as a, a headcount standpoint. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Central Archives is at capacity and needs to expand. Uh, the Medical Examiner's Office, which right now we've listed at 14, likely is also going to have to expand. Um, I think we heard from the medical examiner before he left, uh, upwards of 25 employees are, are really needed in that space. Um, and like I said before, refrigeration and autopsy space also presents an additional uh, space consideration in there. Okay. So let's look at the FC analysis for the geriatric facility. Uh, we are projecting around $99 million of needs uh, for the campus as it is without getting rid of any of the buildings if we decide to look at it from a perspective of all the buildings, all the 22 first buildings stay as they are. We are projecting a need of around $99 million over the next 20 years. Okay, so, uh, and if you look at the FCI chart over here, uh, the biggest initial investment comes in the replacement of generators. My understanding is the facility has around three generators, a bunch of them require replacement. I think two of them require replacement. The generators not only supply the fair acres, but they also supply, uh, supply the, uh, the 911 center as a backup, and as well as the juvenile detention center, if I'm not wrong. Okay, there is also a requirement for chiller upgrades at the facility. And uh, you can clearly see that this is an older facility as compared to other facilities. And so unabated FCI just skyrockets in a scenario from 2024 onwards. Okay, and within next five to 10 years, it reaches a poor condition. So energy conservation me measures, uh, almost $600,000 of uh, projects were identified for the fair acres. Uh, a bulk of those were around the envelope. The facilities are older. So there's a big, big opportunity of having savings through envelope upgrade through improving insulation. A lot of the buildings lack insulation, attic insulation, uh, absolutely zero attic insulation. The exterior walls also don't have insulation. These are standard uh, old style brick walls. So there's a lot of moisture intrusion coming from the basement, uh, which requires encapsulation. At the same time, uh, the lack of attic insulation causes the heat to be lost during the winter time as well. So though the facility has really good and efficient heating and cooling central systems uh, with really smart people running them, and smart systems at the heart of the HVAC systems. The issue really lies with individual buildings, which are potentially uh, least energy efficient on the whole portfolio, causing a lot of energy drain. Further, 
we did observe that there was almost 50,000 gallons of uh, condensate loss per month at this facility where the steam doesn't come back to the main uh, boiler plant. So that's a significant amount of loss that the boiler plant takes on uh, as fresh water has to be introduced and that has to be boiled and uh, then sent out in the form of steam uh, to the buildings. So uh, we are encouraging the county to look into improving the envelope at the same time uh, installing um, tech valves and uh, meters uh, for each building so as to meter which building is losing the most steam and chill water through the system, right? If you look at the savings analysis, uh, again, plumbing is going to be across the board a high number, but uh, lighting and mechanical are the second highest saving opportunities over here. Uh, currently, the site stands at 218 kbTUs per square feet, which is pretty high. Uh, but, uh, and the savings, if you look at it, you stand to save around five, 5,882 million BTUs of annual energy savings, right? Equivalent to 621 metric tons of CO2 savings. It's less as compared to the courthouse, primarily because the, the, the heart of the system, that is the boilers and the chillers are of really good, are really in good condition as compared to other facilities, right? Next slide. Mike, before you jump too much further, I saw Francine had her hand up a second ago. No, I'm okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to the Lima campus, which is right next door to the Fair Acres campus, uh, but it has a different use that so we decided to split it out into a separate campus of its own uh, for the purposes of the study. Um, the Lima campus is, is right along Middletown Road. It consists of three buildings, the first being the uh, State Police Crime Lab, which was recently renovated uh, and is in pretty good shape. Um, the second is the uh, existing 911 call center slash emergency operations center. And the third is the juvenile detention center. The estimated workforce at these, again, is a bit of a moving target. Uh, the crime lab is a leased out space. So we really didn't go into uh, understanding the staffing for the crime lab. Um, for the EOC, we found that there's about 184 staff that work in there. And for the juvenile detention center, there was a population of, of roughly 158 uh, individuals in there. That includes uh, 66 offenders, as well as the staffing that supports them. And that is uh, the next moving target that we're gonna come across as we go through the study in terms of spatial analysis. Um, because we're not really sure where that one's gonna end up in the next couple of years in terms of operations and, uh, and population and census. Um, so as it stands right now, we did look at the juvenile detention center based on the current square footage, and based on the, uh, the current staffing and the, and the max capacity configuration of the building. And we found that it's about 6,000 square feet uh, short of space, which isn't dramatic. Um, the EOC, however, was showing us a, a deficit of about 23,145 DGSF. Really, it, it needs to double in size in order to function properly. Um, some of that's just because the space as it's being used now is, is very inefficient. Um, some of it is because as technology evolves and grows um, within the county, things like uh, 911 by text requires more operators that requires more of those large stations that you see in, a, in the 911 call center. Um, in thinking about the juvenile detention center a little bit more here, uh, understanding the amount of offenders that could be housed on campus is really key to understanding how much space they, they really need. Um, based on benchmarking, we found that a, a good figure is about 620 net square feet per juvenile offender to size a juvenile detention facility. So if we were to assume a facility that holds 15 juveniles, based on the fact that at the time of its closing this past May, I think it was less than 10, um, in theory, you could open a, a juvenile detention center that's roughly 9,300 to 10,000 square feet. Um, to accommodate that function. Now that doesn't include things like the gymnasium, the classrooms. Um, there are some other spatial considerations that would need to be factored in there, but in reality, it, it wouldn't take up the full amount of square footage that you have right now. So the building could be at least partially vacated, if not fully vacated, and that function could be, uh, could remain on campus and something else could move in with it, or it could be uh, eliminated altogether. Dr. Taylor, I see your hand up. If you have a question. 
Yes, I just had a question about that, uh, the analysis on the Juvenile Detention Center. Would that be keeping in mind the regulations around gender separation? No, right now it's, it's just a raw headcount um, calculation. Um, we, don't, we haven't really gone into the specifics. We would recommend you know, moving further with the Juvenile Detention Center or really anything else um, following the study that a, a deeper dive master plan or even a conceptual plan would need to be done that really starts to develop the program a little bit more and starts to consider those factors in a little more depth. Um, when we started the project, we were going to get into some of those details, but um, with the, the closing of the facility, we, uh, we kind of held off on that one. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Kasta, you want to take us through the uh, technical side of this? Yeah, can you hear us? Sorry, I, I, I was on mute. I was saying that I think we might have skipped a slide. Is there a, sky, a slide before this? Okay, mm -hmm. I think we probably deleted it actually. Okay, so uh, Crime Lab, it's, it's almost a brand new building, uh, constructed very recently. Everything is in excellent condition. So FCI is absolutely not an issue. There are, there are actually no needs until uh, in a couple of years. Right now there's only uh, asphalt paving a uh, seal and stripe is required, but like until 2029, there are not many needs. Like building exterior wall painting is, is a thing that coming up in 2022, but again, not, nothing significant for that building as such. 911 center, a uh, lot of issues over there, right? Uh, there is a hodgepodge system of HVAC systems that runs the building. Uh, it's kind of the nerve center of the whole uh, crime prevention unit and uh, police uh, policing system at the county, but uh, we have a central uh, number two oil fired boilers system that sends hot water to uh, hydronic heat pump systems, which uh, condition a part of the building. The servers are the air conditioning system that serves the servers as well as the data centers has gone down a couple of years ago and uh, for a few years, that's our understanding. We have portable uh, air conditioning system that is serving the needs for that space. And there are a bunch of split system that serve the cooling requirements for other locations in the building. So um, it's, it's a building with a cluster of different HVAC systems which have been piecemeal together so as to meet the requirements of the facility. Uh, in general, the facility is located right next to the juvenile detention center. Uh, and so as, as a fact of expansion, there's not much space for expansion over there. The systems are old, the lighting system is old, the HVAC system is old. So there's a lot of requirement for upgrades in that facility, as you can see. Uh, next slide. Uh, juvenile detention center, uh, one thing that we observed is the HVAC system is in good condition. They have recently invested in new boiler system. The chiller is less than 10 years old. The HVAC systems in general, the air handling units included are, of, are in really good shape uh, with uh, state of art systems like variable air volume, uh, VFTs on all motors. <clears throat> so from HVAC perspective, it's in a really good condition. Uh, the challenge with the building is occupancy being low so even if the occupancy is low, you have to condition the whole facility. So as Mike said, that you may not require as much bigger space to keep a, such a small number of residents, which can be suffice in 10,000 square feet. And so irrespective of the occupancy being low, the whole building needs to be conditioned. Now, one thing that needs to be kept in mind is the fair acres is the, the biggest energy consumer in the whole Lima campus and the Fair Acres com complex area. So the Fair Acres is actually supplying a part of the energy requirement to Juvenile Detention Center. And unfortunately, there is no metering system in place by which we can determine the amount of electric energy that is being supplied by the Fair Acres to Juvenile Detention Center. So though Juvenile has its own electric meter, uh, it, the consumption is so low that it just doesn't make sense to figure out what systems are run by that meter as compared to uh, how much energy is being supplied by fair acres to it. Next slide. <clears throat> so 
when we look at the energy conservation measures for the Lima campus, the, the key of the key measures come from both 911 as well as juvenile detention center. It's around $250,000, HVAC being the biggest one, uh, predominantly for a 911 center, uh, followed by lighting, which goes across both uh, juvenile as well as uh, the 911. All the exterior lights are LED, but interior systems are still traditional linear fluorescent uh, fixtures. Controls is the third biggest item, again, for 911 center. Uh, the biggest bang for the buck is going to come from HVAC upgrades followed by lighting upgrades over here. Okay, uh, next slide. <clears throat> so uh, if you look at the Lima campus, um, I'm going to request the audience not to focus on the energy use intensity over here because we, we are not able to get the data for the number two oil use at, at these locations, which pick up the bulk of the heating load. So the natural gas is being used for domestic hot water at the juvenile detention center, as well as, I think juvenile detention center is the only one. It uses natural gas for domestic hot water, whereas for 911 center, it uses electric hot water heaters, right? And electric, again, is based on whatever meter data is available for those particular buildings. There is a part of energy that is supplied by fair acres. So it's kind of a mixed match and it's very difficult to uh, break down of how much energy is actually being consumed by these buildings. On the right hand side, you can see that there's almost 943 million BTUs of energy saving potential over here, equivalent to 349 metric tons of CO2 reduction, right? Vast majority comes from controls upgrade uh, followed by lighting. That's going to be a standard theme you will be seeing across this portfolio. Uh, controls and lighting are two biggest aspects where the county can find a lot of savings which can be reinvested into other major capital programs towards energy efficiency. Next slide, Mike. Hmm. Correction facility. Mike, you might be on mute. Being back in the real world, I have forgotten about the mute button. <laughs> uh, we're gonna jump into the George Hill Correctional Facility next. Um, George Hill has its own campus with a number of buildings located on it. Uh, it is by square footage, the largest collection of buildings that the county owns um, in one location. So looking at the staffing for this one, we see an estimated workforce of about 505 employees. Um, I, I believe at the moment, five of those are county employees and the rest are employees of, of uh, the operator. Um, the prison is noted to have an inmate capacity of roughly uh, 1,883 inmates. Um, and we do project a slight growth in the number of employees by 2035, but what we're not as confident on, and again, we're not even really confident on the 510 at this point, um, is what the inmate count will be um, by 2035. Um, based on the conditions that we see them right now, we're projecting a shortage of about 190,000 square feet on the George Hill uh, campus. And a lot of that is really just because of the benchmarking that went into analyzing the, the campus. Um, so uh, the GIO notes that uh, typically you'd want to account 415 net square feet per inmate for a state prison, which this is not, uh, but this is the, that was the nearest benchmarking factor that we could find. Um, and what you're going to find as we go through the analysis of this is that while the main prison probably comes pretty close to that 415 square foot uh, benchmark number. Um, the weekender unit out here, which also houses uh, inmates, does not. Um, so what, you can, what you're seeing here is the weekender unit houses about 206 inmates and the remaining 1677 are housed in the main prison. In the main prison, each inmate has a cell, actually it's a shared cell, so two bunks with a toilet and a bench. Um, and they all have access to a large day room uh, outside of the cells in each one of the cell blocks. Over in the weekender unit, uh, a number of beds are, are pushed in, in, a, in fairly close proximity and the, the day room is really just the middle of the space. So there's a much more uh, dense population living in the weekender unit than what's living in the main prison. And I think that's a part of the reason why you're seeing uh, such a dramatic shortfall in the numbers as they stand right now. 
But in looking at the stats of, as they've been uh, reported to the state, we did notice that in 2018, um, the correctional facility stopped reporting uh, building number two as, as housing inmates. So the capacity dropped from what was being reported as 1883. There's a slight reduction here. We suspect that's because of construction and taking some units offline um, down to 1677, which is the exact number of inmates that would be uh, held in the main facility. Um, you can also see that's pushed uh, the prison over capacity in that time period for 2018 and 2019. And then in 2020, COVID-19 hit um, and the prisons were, were emptied out as much as they possibly could be, which is why you're seeing this significant drop here. We don't know um, what's gonna happen after 2020. We're also not sure what, um, what that reconsideration really means in terms of how many inmates can be held at the prison. So assuming that Delaware County wants to take the weekender unit offline and only house inmates in the main building, that does change the square footage burden on the campus. Um, so we go from 190,000 square foot deficit now to about 73,000 square feet. Thanks, Mike. So for the Georgia Correction Facility, uh, uh, we are projecting around $56 million of needs across 20 years. Uh, now this doesn't include the old prison that needs to be demolished. Uh, this ex excludes the old prison as well as an abandoned barn, uh, but all of the facility, including the weekender, the canal, as well as the Sunshine Village, uh, all inclusive, we're projecting $56 million of investment. Uh, the interior uh, finishes are around 17 million. Um, be being a prison, it takes a lot of beating uh, on the interior finishes. And so the wear and tear uh, is always a cost over there. Second thing is the roofing is around $13 million. The roof is almost at the end of its useful life over there. And the third biggest item should be the HVAC. Yeah, the HVAC is around $4 million over there, uh, which is still a pr pretty big item followed by plumbing because plumbing, every cell has a, a toilet and a faucet. So plumbing adds up pretty quickly. Plus when you consider the plumbing cost for a prison system is much higher as compared to standard commercial fixtures, right? HVAC system, uh, I want to spend a, a second talking about HVAC system. Uh, we observed that uh, the HVAC was uh, one, of, uh, one of the things that required the most attention with most of the systems almost reaching end of its useful life. And some of the systems are being operated past its useful life. Uh, so we understand currently it's been operated by a private operator and uh, the systems, once they pass the useful life, can be deemed to break at any moment. So that that causes a red flag to be raised of what needs to be upgraded, right? So one of the items over here that needs to be uh, looked at immediately is fixing the roof on the buildings, which is almost $2.8 million. Plumbing system is uh, in, not in a great shape. At the present, we are on $1.8 million of expenditure that's coming up followed by interior lighting upgrades, which is around 1.7 million. The lighting system has been original. Now this doesn't include the LED upgrade. This is a purely an FCA exercise that points out towards lighting upgrades in the prison uh, facility. Next one. So when we look at energy conservation measures, uh, it's around $1.1 million worth of uh, initial investment. A bulk majority are uh, HVAC upgrades over here that you can see followed by lighting. Retro These are again, most of them are retrofits uh, for lighting. Uh, uh, unless they're exterior fixtures, we recommend doing retrofits if the fixtures are in decent condition. Controls upgrade will be around a quarter million dollars. So the biggest bang for the buck comes from the lighting upgrade. There's not much savings to be achieved by high efficiency plumbing fixtures. This is a prison. so. That, that doesn't apply over here. So HVAC and lighting are the two biggest avenues for savings for the county in this scenario. Next slide. So uh, the, where does the prison stand currently? It stands at around 24 kBTUs per square feet, which is a decent rating. Uh, whereas the savings that we can generate is almost going to be uh, 12 uh, million. Am I reading it there? Yeah, 12 million uh, BTUs of annual energy savings. You know, it's it's probably the second highest or close to what the courthouse is capable of generating in terms of savings with 
6,869 metric tons of CO2 being offset. A bulk majority comes from HVAC systems. Again, these systems are old. They are using R22 refrigerant, which has been phased out uh, as of year 2020. And so uh, almost all the rooftop package units were observed to be operating on using R22 refrigerant, which needs to be uh, replaced with systems running R410 refrigerants. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, and that brings us to um, the next campus, which is down in uh, Sharon Hill, uh, the Emergency Services Training uh, Center. Uh, this site is a former EPA Superfund site. Uh, it used to be a uh, Delaware County um, incinerator facility. It was uh, converted in 1990, I believe, uh, to become the, the training center. Um, so there's only two buildings on campus that seem to house any kind of administrative or office space, and that is building number one, which is the old incinerator. This one's being used as a headquarters for staff running the entire campus. There's four staff that, that do that. Um, and then building number four, which is the probation and juvenile probation office. Um, the rest of the buildings are generally warehouse buildings. Uh, training happens within them. A lot of storage happens within them. But as you're gonna see when CalSTUB uh, speaks next, because the interior finishes are not as a high of a quality as what they would be in the other buildings that we've talked about today, the needs for them are gonna be less because they're really just storage and warehouse. <clears throat> so on the campus, there's roughly 51 employees. By 2035, we estimate they may add another one, uh, prim primarily in the probation services building. Um, currently, looking at the square footage that's utilized, we're only going to look at building one and building four, again, because the rest of the buildings are, are really warehouse space. Um, so we see there's about 66,800 square feet uh, of building available there for use. The needs associated with that are about 14,000 uh, square feet, um, leaving you with a surplus delta of about 52,000 square feet on that campus. But again, because this building is so heavily used for an educational component, a lot of that space is classroom space, um, training space, and otherwise just finished space uh, to, uh, to meet with uh, trainees um, and walk them through their training regimen. So it is utilized space, despite the, the fact that the headcount doesn't really match it. Building number four, as I mentioned, is the one building that we really do see a bit of a deficit on the campus. Um, currently, it's about 6,800 square feet of space. Um, but given the staffing needs that are within it, we suspect it really needs to be about 8,000 square feet, putting it at about 1,200 square feet short. There's three uh, departments on campus that we think occupy this. Uh, one is adult probation and juvenile probation. Um, the third is community corrections, and I believe community corrections, and speaking with the staff out there, uh, was formerly housed in uh, one of the other buildings that is currently taken up by the medical examiner's office. However, in speaking with that staff, they were pretty unclear on the future of the, of the program, mainly because of the fact that there hadn't been a whole lot of uh, team leads because of COVID. Um, so once the pandemic ends, you may see an increased need for additional space on this campus, once again, as the as community service becomes a viable option uh, for rehabilitation of offenders in the county. Um, when it comes to, to building number four, expansion on a Superfund site isn't really an easy thing to do. The site is, is capped, uh, which is holding the contaminants down below the main ground level and hopefully keeping them from discharging uh, via surface runoff into the, a nearby creek. Um, the other thing that we noticed with this building is that for offenders to actually come and use it, the closest mass transit stop is out on Hook Road, leaving a uh, 3,725 foot walk for an offender that doesn't have a vehicle um, to get back to the probation office, which isn't really uh, inducive to many offenders coming regularly to uh, see their probation officers. Just another item of consideration for this campus. Thanks, Mike. Um, so the emergency services training houses a number of buildings. A lot of these buildings are for drill purposes, uh, especially for the firemen as, uh, as well as evacuation drills. So uh, as Mike mentioned, that there are two buildings that are regularly housing um, offices and spaces. 
the probation building as well as the old incinerator building. The total needs that we identified for all these buildings is uh, $7 million. The, the reason to point out that only two buildings really house individuals is because the other buildings are purely shells with no significant HVAC systems in it. Uh, some of them even don't even have electric connections to it. So uh, they are considered more as a shed. So 7 million needs, which is probably the lowest amongst all the groups uh, in the county, a uh, bulk of that coming through HVAC and uh, roofing, which is around 1.5 and $1.1 million followed by site pavement. This extensive amount of site paving required at this site due to interior roads leading to different buildings and training locations. Uh, then um, the other costs include like interior finishes and facade upgrades at this facility. Okay. Do you want to go to the next slide? So if you look at the FCI, uh, one of the key items over here is the roof upgrade that's coming up at the main building, which is around $165,000, followed by uh, asphalt roofing, which is again a roofing project on the gun range slash cafeteria at $87,000. And then uh, there are three furnaces that need to be replaced at the main building, which is around $20,000 requirement. The FCI graph doesn't show any major red signs even if it's unabated uh, over the next 10 years, it's not going to cross the fair point. So I think this campus is probably one of the better campuses uh, of all the campuses. Next slide, please. From an energy perspective, energy savings perspective, we are looking at around $123,000 of projects over here. Uh, heavy lighting. Uh, this is, as I said, the two buildings with HVAC system, others are if they're connected to electric supply, it will have one or two light bulbs in it for training facilities. Otherwise, other, other buildings are purely uh, illuminated for lighting and interior use purposes. Uh, bulk of your saving comes from lighting, followed by HVAC controls and very minimal from plumbing uh, from the, uh, the staff that is permanently housed over there. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, Site EUI is 3.13, which, which in one way kind of fakes out to be really good because we are using square feet for all possible buildings at the campus, right? So these are not all the buildings uh, that are conditioned, but we have to consider all the buildings that are at the campus. And based on that, it comes to around 3.13. We have a potential of saving around 621 metric tons of CO2 uh, by upgrading HVAC and lighting systems over here itself. Uh, total costs uh, removed equivalent will be 134 and the equivalent uh, acres of pine tree planted will be 141 once all the proposed measures are implemented at this site. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay. And the remaining campus is a, is a collection of uh, miscellaneous buildings that are in Chester City. Um, those include uh, the probation services building at 5th and Penn, uh, the voting machine warehouse, which is a little further out on the outskirts of uh, Chester, um, and that old Chester, the 1725, 1724 old Chester County Courthouse um, on the Avenue of the States. Um, combined, we estimate these buildings hold well about 61 employees now, and that staffing will grow slightly to 63 by 2035. Um, um, and uh, as it stands right now, for the most part, there's really not many spatial considerations to be had out here. Um, Fifth and Penn is, is under renovation. The first phase is complete. That's for adult probation. Um, next up is juvenile probation. There's also a uh, PA DOH, sorry, this would be DOH for Department of Health, not DOG, um, space that's leased out by the county to the state. But, Overall, we find that there's a, a little bit of a surplus of about 3,000 square feet in there. I'm, I'm sure by the time that's all uh, factored, it'll, it'll net out to a, a nice even and clean program within that building. Um, <clears throat> in terms of other considerations, um, Fifth and Penn really is a, a pretty nice location. It's right in downtown Chester. This is 291. Um, the, the building itself has a fairly small footprint on the site, uh, which is boarded by the, uh, I think it's the, it's either the Chester Creek or the Darby Creek, forgive me. Um, there is a FEMA floodplain that comes through here. It takes up some of the site, but it doesn't take up all of the site. So there is a development opportunity on here to further build out 
um, something else should the county choose to. There's actually adequate parking on there to, uh, to support small uh, build out if that's the direction that the county chooses to go. Um, at the voting machine warehouse, there are gonna be some additional storage needs that need to be considered over time uh, with the election laws changing over the past few years, how uh, unused paper ballots are, are handled and where they get stored um, is something that seemed to be having an impact on their operations when we went out to visit them in the summertime. The other thing that we noticed about the warehouse is that it's unconditioned space, which is uh, something that needs to be uh, reconsidered given the uh, amount of technology that's being integrated into the election process now. And uh, at the 1724 uh, Chester County Courthouse, it's a historic structure um, that's actually in pretty robust condition despite uh, what we found in the FCI. Um, there is an office on the second floor of the building. It's suitable for a small office suite, of four to six people. However, just keep in mind with that building that um, there's no ADA accessibility to get up there. So uh, adding an elevator or trying to find some more accessible means uh, of access may be a consideration for any kind of future use on that facility. Thank you, Mike. So uh, in Chester City, we did an FCA on all the three buildings and identified needs around $5 million over the next 20 years uh, with a bulk of them coming from interior uh, requirements like interior finishes. Uh, second biggest was the HVAC and electrical upgrade. Electrical upgrade typically comes at a 40 year mark on a facility. Uh, it's, it's assumed that every facility a building's life is typically assumed to be around 40 to 50 years because that's when most of the predominant common systems in the building come to end of its useful life. The electrical system needs to be upgraded at end of 40 years. HVAC system needs a major rehab at the end of 40 to 50 years. So uh, in this facility, you can clearly see that, or in this group of facilities, you can clearly see a bunch of those items coming up for renovation pretty quickly. Uh, in terms of electrical upgrade, HVAC upgrade, roofing cost, right? And so uh, though it's just $5 million as compared to other campuses, which are around $100 million of needs, there are, there are items that to be considered over here as the buildings get old. Next one. <clears throat> so fifth and pen, as Mike said, uh, Mike, uh, fifth and pen is undergoing, uh, is planned to undergo a renovation, correct? Yeah. So. Fifth and Penn is planned to undergo major renovation uh, over there. So uh, as a result of that, we didn't complete an energy audit on that facility. We just purely did an FCA analysis to understand the needs requirement. So uh, there is a small amount of interior finishes in terms of VCD tiles, exhaust fan replacement, and exterior brick pointing. That shows up in 2021 but a bulk majority of the costs as per us should come up in 2029. But if the renovation goes as per plans, then <clears throat> uh, everything changes and you can consider almost the whole system uh, as an excellent condition and the clock starts ticking again from 20 to 22 onwards. The voting machine warehouse um, building, as Mike said, a lot of considerations have to be taken. Uh, uh, a lot of things have to be taken into consideration over here, especially with changing laws. Uh, we are seeing a, a little bit of expenditure on it uh, in terms of um, from a building envelope consistent like cracked asphalt in the paving. Uh, the building is old uh, in itself. So uh, a bunch of things are uh, coming up for replacement. There's a plumbing system which needs to be taken a look at. It's $120,000 of expenditure. That means the whole plumbing system of the building needs to be uh, re-examined and replaced if required. VCD tiles, that is interior flooring tiles, are up for replacement around $50,000 over there, uh, which is coming up in 2023. Next slide, Mike. <clears throat> the old Chester Courthouse is, the, uh, uh, is one of the latest building uh, in the county's portfolio. Uh, we understand that there's a major renovation that's going to be happening over there uh, as, uh, as part of the acquisition. Mike, correct me if I'm wrong over here, but uh, uh, a lot of upgrades are coming up over there in terms of lighting upgrade, chiller replacement, as well as building HVAC upgrades that will be coming up uh, in the 2021-2022 area. Uh, but the unabated uh, FCI it will rise if the upgrades don't go through uh, at this facility. Okay. <clears throat> 
from an energy perspective, uh, as mentioned earlier, we performed energy audits only on a voting machine warehouse center, uh, identified measures were around $23,000, uh, significant proportion were lighting. Uh, over there, the building is relatively smaller. So lighting is the biggest uh, opportunity over there. Savings again is uh, heavily from lighting followed by envelope upgrade purely through making the building more um, airtight over here. That's where the main savings are from. Uh, site UI analysis, 30.46. So uh, it's a pretty decent shape. Uh, when you look at site EUI, energy use intensity, uh, if you look at the energy savings, around 272 million BTUs of energy savings uh, can be achieved by implementing the measures, which were around 24 or $26,000 on the previous slide, resulting in around 77 metric tons of CO2 savings. Again, uh, you will see a higher portion of savings from envelope because clearly natural gas is being used for heating and the BTU savings is much higher through natural gas as compared to electric over here. So um, there's not much cooling, but a significant amount of heating that goes inside this building. So there you go. There's a, a lot of savings through envelope followed by lighting. Yeah, next slide. <clears throat> so conclusions. All right, so in terms of uh, space analysis, um, going through each of the campuses, we find that there's a bit of a range uh, in spatial deficit uh, throughout the county, but ultimately we're concluding that this, the county really could add 234, actually 235,000 to 408,000 uh, square feet uh, to bring all of its functions up to an operating industry standard, um, just to make it function appropriately. Um, However, there's a few other considerations that go along with that. Um, your leased spaces at other locations within the county. Uh, so you still have a human services office as well as your COSA office in Eddystone. Uh, this houses a significant number of staff, 157 uh, staff projected for DHS by 2035 and 104 uh, COSA staff projected in that building by 2035, which really tacks on another uh, about 68,000 square feet of need. Um, in Upper Darby, you have human services with about 443 staff projected by 2035, which is another 116,000 square feet of need. And in uh, Yaden, you have a, a, a new location for the, the new Department of Health for Delaware County. Um, that's within the Yaden Shopping Center. We're estimating that to have a staff of roughly 68 by 2035, although that one is, is new and growing and, and um, we're still not exactly sure how that's gonna grow or what the ambitions are for that one quite yet. Um, so it's, it's really just an educated guess. Um, but based on that, we're estimating a need of about 18,000 square feet um, for them by 2035. So mixing them in, there's about 175,000 Need, uh, square foot of additional need, assuming that the county would like to bring all functions that live within a leased space under the county roof and uh, try to discontinue paying uh, any kind of rent in the future um, on those leases. So that's strictly a voluntary thing. That's a decision that the county needs to, to make. Um, but should the county decide to go that way, we're projecting that the county would need to add about 410,000 to 584,000 square feet of space just based on the range. Uh, from the FCA perspective, uh, again, we looked at FCI for different buildings and uh, there are 23% of the buildings uh, that fall under the poor category. That means the FCI crosses the 30% threshold. 41% of the buildings fall in the fair category. Uh, so. They still require some attention, but they are still not in as bad of a condition, but this is as of today. But uh, unabated FCI will quickly creep into the poor category over there. 22% of the buildings are in excellent category. That's really good. We encourage continued maintenance on them. And around 14% of your all total portfolio is in the good category. So uh, big picture over here is around 36% of your buildings are in good to excellent condition uh, and 23% are in like dire need of attention right now. 
Uh, the 10 year escalated needs for the whole counties are $104 million. Uh, just recapping what we uh, said over the last few slides with uh, the courthouse requiring around $46 million of needs within the next 10 years and the George Hill Correction Facility around $41 million of needs um, or the next. So between the two itself, we are hitting close to $90 million uh, between the Delaware County and the George Hill Correction Facility. Whereas the geriatric is around 2 million and Chester buildings are 3 million. So uh, the, the two biggest places to focus will be the courthouse complex as well as the George Hill Correction Facility at the county. Next slide, please. From energy perspective, there is a lot of opportunities for the county around $3 million of investment. Uh, I would say a drop in a bucket as compared to the needs over here, which, which were around 100 million. So $3 million of, I'm going to call this as an investment and not as a cost, whereas a need is a cost, right? And uh, there is around $530,000 of utility and operation maintenance cost savings that can be achieved by the county on a year over year basis. Uh, around 17,000 metric tons of CO2 can be offset by um, undertaking these uh, projects. We do understand that uh, Delaware County has a big picture goal of going net zero. It's sister county, the Chester County is also looking into seeing if we can go to net zero. And as the time progresses, a number of counties and states, cities and other councils are trying to aim for net zero. So keeping in mind a big picture, I think this is a really encouraging and good step where if the county decides to go forward with it, uh, it can help in a massive reduction of carbon emissions, equivalent to again, like 3,851 cars taken off the road, almost equivalent to a small towns cars taken away, right? And 4,000 acres of uh, pine tree forest planted. So major impact can be achieved by implementing these measures that have been identified for the county. So with that, I think we come to the conclusion and uh, we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. <clears throat> and we're sorry for going over our time limit and appreciate anybody sticking around who wants to, uh, to ask questions. Yeah, does anyone have any feedback or, or questions about the information that was just presented? I mean, I guess I just have a general comment. Thank you to the KCBA team uh, for your thorough work. I know this has been a massive undertaking <laughs> to do this assessment, to say the least. Uh, so thank you very much for everything that you've been doing on this project. Well, thanks for letting us help you. It's actually been a fun process for us to just walk through every single one of your facilities. Um, Delaware County offers a wide range of services and being able to walk through uh, you know, library services or the courthouse uh, or even the morgue. Um, has just been really insightful and a very interesting experience, um, I think, for everybody on the team. And, and we really op we, we appreciate that opportunity greatly. So thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? This is yeah. Becca Yurkovich speaking. Okay, hello. Um, I'm a member of the committee, and I also had the privilege of previously working in the county. Um, so I really appreciate the work that you guys are doing. Um, and I guess one of my big questions throughout your analysis is um, for your estimates for future employees, did that take into account um, if there were departments that were already in a deficit? So let's say there were employees with vacancies that were all not already meeting their needs um, in terms of employees, um, or was it strictly just looking at the demographics and job output for the future based on the current number? So for right now, it's, it's strictly a, a math exercise of looking at the demographics and, and jobs. Um, as a next step, kind of what I mentioned before when, uh, with Dr. Taylor's question, we really would need to get into a master planning exercise to get into the um, more of the specifics that go along with each one of those departments. Um, having talked to a lot of the, de the directors and department heads, um, we know that there are some discrepancies every once in a while with, uh, you know, an overage in, in the number of staff. Um, and that's why we compared the 2019 and the 2020 uh, data, just to kind of double check a few things. We, kn we knew there were some reductions there, but we knew where they were. Um, but to answer your question, no, it doesn't really 
it doesn't really get into the specifics of a, on a by department basis of who's a little short on staff and who's a little over on staff. That needs to go uh, into a programming exercise that would happen in the next round, assuming that these uh, these programs want to continue to develop. Okay, thank you. And I do have another question for you. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the estimates based on uh, spatial needs were under the idea that um, I guess people would be returning to these workspaces in normal time. How mm -hmm. do you feel that this analysis can be applied um, in the situation that people may not be going back to the offices that they had previously occupied? So that's a good question. And that's one that we had been considering throughout the process. And that's why it was, it was really important that as we go through and we walk through each one of these buildings, we talk to the directors um, and really understand how COVID-19 was affecting their, their workflow. And one of the questions that we most routinely asked um, was, how do you see COVID-19 affecting your, your future work environment um, or how people work within your department? And I would say the vast, the very vast majority 98, 99% noted that they didn't really see an impact. There were a few that said that some staff would likely, um, you know, work shorter hours in the office, but would definitely be coming back to the office. Um, so there is definitely a work from home component that would reduce the number of hours um, that staff is on site, um, which could lead to some efficiency in the future. You know, maybe you end up going from uh, large workstations to, to benching workstations, but um, based on our conversations with staff in Delaware County, it didn't seem like there was going to be a dramatic impact um, in terms of returning to work post-pandemic um, for their office spaces. Yeah, one one uh, woman that we spoke with uh, in particular, Mimi Walker, when we were talking about the, the current building, um, you know, at the time that we were there, which was, I just looked at my notes, it was back in, in March, um, there were a few people returning, but not everybody was returning. But in some cases, they were returning in you know, one or two days a week so that because they have and deal with the public so much, they deal with human services so much that maybe there's a hybrid situation where they're home a day or two, but they still needed that touchdown space that when they get back to that office, they still need to have uh, an area where they can meet with members of the public that may come in for uh, counseling and services and things like that. So um, to Mike's point, um, you know, again, we're all in, in uncharted territory, but most of the government services things that you guys are dealing with involve one-on-one -on -one interactions and involves um, needing a place to, to go to work. Um, so I think those numbers um, are, are pretty valid of, of what he's sharing, saying, hey, there's a need now uh, and you're growing in the future. That need is just going to be, be larger, um, you know, uh, and certainly more so uh, after the pandemic. Uh, hopefully ends uh, uh, in the near future. Sure, thank you. Thank you. When, um, when it was considered, when HVAC choices were considered in terms of replacements or improvements, was it always, if it's a gas boiler, is it always considered replacement with another gas boiler? Was there any consideration for upgrading to heat pumps and using new distribution systems? Um, or is distribution systems a factor that would not allow you to consider um, other fuel sources when, change, when uh, considering what mechanical equipment to be uh, in, installed? Um, but, you know, especially the, the, the buildings that were on oil, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the juvenile detention center campus, um, that would, and, and you said there were central air conditioners, that would seem like a, a great facility that could be changed to heat pumps instead of, uh, instead of, again, oil boilers, oil furnaces. So just want to know what kind of fuel switching was considered in the process, if any. So great question. So the when we when we started this program, Delaware County gave us a mandate of trying to help them reduce their overall carbon footprint. There was um, there are two kind of projects when we approach such kind of things, right? One is 
uh, a mandate to reduce carbon footprint at whatever cost. And the other is trying to optimize energy use and reduce your consumption as well as cost. We were given the second mandate, how to reduce the cost as well as energy use at the facility. Right? So when you're given a mandate where you're trying to reduce the expenditure as well as energy use at a facility, we start looking into measures which are financially feasible as well as cost, as well as energy efficient, right? So uh, the first question that you asked, what, did we replace gas-fired boilers with high efficiency gas-fired boilers? The answer is yes, right? Because if we decide to, the alternative to an hydronic distribution system is installing a variable refrigerant flow system. Uh, that's the, the typical alternative that we go for if we decide to go away from hydronic. And at that point, you have to almost uh, shut down the building, do a complete gut rehab, tear out the HVAC system and install new um, this distribution system over there, which variable refrigerant flow system is, right? And that doesn't always become cost effective when you're trying to do a retrofit because there is a whole different cost associated with stopping the work at the building, relocating the staff, right? So uh, the way we approach this problem is trying to see what is the best way forward so as to make the buildings as efficient as possible in a cost-effective manner. And in the initial part, I talked about savings to investment ratio in passing, which in a sense means that if you decide to invest a dollar today, would you get the money back on your investment within the life of the project? So the projects that we are recommending the county is to see if the, the projects that we are recommending the county are only the ones where they're going to become like cost effective, where, where they're going to get the money back on it, right? They're financially feasible. Now, as when it comes to a juvenile detention center, those boilers are relatively new. Uh, we are not sure the rationale behind installing those boilers over there, but uh, it seems those are dual fire, dual fire boilers, which means they can be fired both on gas as well as oil. The burners are dual fuel burners over there. So it can be easily switched over from oil to natural gas once it's done. The challenge over there is getting an appropriate uh, sizing of gas line to the facility so that it can feed the boilers requirements. My understanding is the current sizing of the gas line is proportional to the requirement of domestic hot water uh, boilers alone and not the space heating. Uh, when it comes to the 911 center, it's absolutely recommended to walk away from the number two oil fuel, right? But again, that system is uh, a mixed bag of so many different things that it's highly recommended that a major gut rehab take place and you upgrade everything to a central system. And at that point, the county can potentially decide to go even for a geothermal route because they have open area in the back, background, which is which was slightly outside the, the scope. But uh, if, if I have to give an opinion, that might be a possibility as well, right? Based on the final requirement. But currently it's such a mixed bag of system. Uh, on top of that, reliability is absolutely important with data centers and the 911 center. So you need to have redundancy over there. So a lot of things to be considered over there, but uh, I, I hope I have somewhat answered your question in this case. Yeah, I figured distribution system was a limiting factor on uh, a lot of yes. choices, but um, um, I just wanted to make sure that we're, you know, if we're trying to decarbonize society, the best way to do that is to go all electric and go to heat pumps, but I, I, as as when, when it's practical as much as possible. So absolutely. I realize that that yeah. A lot of the older buildings have hydronic distribution or seam distribution system, and unless there is a major gut rehab where you go for a, a variable air volume rooftop package system, it kind of becomes a challenge to uh, like change yeah. the existing HVAC distribution system. My other question. Um, you alluded to uh, solar being on the government center. Yeah. Um, and said, so we're, we're gonna come back to that. Uh, but I, I, 
can you elaborate on what solar is being used in the county currently and what opportunities there are for uh, adding solar? I realize there's a lot of investment that needs to be done. So, um, you know, solar may be a cherry on the, on the top, but certainly something that we should think about as long as we're doing this assessment. Uh, I'm trying to pull up the energy data for Delaware County right now. And uh, we know that uh, if you just look at the electric consumption, uh, solar, there's a vast, uh, if I just do a quick, just give me a second, I'll give you a, the correct yeah, answer. I can, while you're looking at that, I can add, as, as yeah. far as I know right now, the government center is the only solar installation right. that we have. And it, it covers about 5% of the complex, the, the courthouse right. complexes use because it's okay. all on one electrical meter, maybe two. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the only solar installation we have. So there's certain, certainly possibility right. on, on a lot yeah. of these buildings where we can investigate that more. And, you know, I would even jump in and, and add that the, the county has an abundance of land. I, you know, George Hill Correctional Facility is 400 acres. Lima is over 200 acres uh, combined with fair acres. Um, so, yeah, there's, a, there's definitely a possibility to expand. You could put in a, a larger solar field and really start to generate some electricity. It really comes down to, to cost um, and, and what the, uh, the county's appetite is for, for pursuing that. Yeah, you see some things like solar farms and, and surrounding communities where if they, they have a large area like, you know, you know George Hill, and, which is on a hill, um, yeah. would be a perfect kind of south facing area for, you know, several acres versus of, uh, uh, of solar panels installation. So there's a, there's a number of places in the county that could be considered. One of the key things to be considered when you're putting like, as uh, Mike said over here, George Hill is an excellent source. But other buildings, you have to consider the age of the roof. So if the building roof is more than five years old, you typically don't go for solar on it. Uh, solar panels expected useful life is 20 years. The, most of the roof are 20 years expected useful life. So you don't want to uh, put solar panels on a 10 year old roof because it becomes an issue with both warranty and as well as at the time of when the roof has to be replaced. Uh, second avenue for the county to consider is buying green energy. Uh, so it sources a lot of energy from the grid. There is a potential of buying uh, energy from uh, wind farms and as well as solar farms. Uh, so that would be a major source of buying green energy and lowering the carbon footprint right at the butt of it. So we, ac we actually already do. I just don't know the percentage. Um, yeah. yeah, I can I can look that up. But I think that will be a great source as a starting point to make a big impact on uh, reducing the carbon footprint for the whole county itself. Yeah, I just like this Trimble Road. That's uh, the road on the southern end of of George Hill. Um, so as as Castor said, there's you know there's sometimes concerns and sometimes opportunities, sometimes concerns about putting things on roofs. Um, but, you know, large amounts of, of open space like that, that you have kind of going down the south facing part of that George Hill um, uh, facility there would be, uh, you know, again, another enormous area. And it's, it's heavily traveled in there. You know, it's a great kind of showcase of, hey, look what we're doing here. We're doing the right thing. And, um, you know, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice, nice expression on that campus. Uh, there's also an opportunity, uh, should be an opportunity, where we have open parking lots to cover. I, I don't understand why all parking lots aren't covered with, with, uh, with solar panels. There, there, in my mind, is no excuse for it other than cost. And I think now, uh, and now the costs have come down to a point where it's justified. And so I, I'd like to see us uh, uh, putting some... Um, uh, some solar panels out, out there. The existing government center has solar, uh, as you can see on the questions page over here, uh, which kind of shows the Google map view of the government center, you can see there are solar panels on significant portion of the roof of the government center as well as a parking area. And uh, I agree with uh, the gentleman over here that the carport it's called a carport solar panel system and you typically see it Ikea's and everywhere where 
the parking areas are covered with solar panels and the cost has come down significantly. The incremental cost difference is not much when it comes to installation of on-ground fixed tilt versus power port. So uh, there is definitely a consideration with structural needs that has to be taken into consideration, but that is becoming a prominently popular opinion with a lot of malls and commercial establishment office buildings to have uh, parking in carports. It does save a lot on snow removal process, those carports. Do we have any other questions or comments? Does the final report include a section on alternative energy use or, uh, or is that not part of the written scope or, or like, is this just what we're talking about here or is that included in the final document? It was not part of the original scope. And so it's, it's just part of the uh, discussion right now over here. Yeah. Okay. There are a lot of opportunities within the building. Like we, we, we over here as KCBA Bureau Veritas recommend solar as a final frontier to go at. Like the initial is reducing and making the buildings efficient in itself. And as you can see through the slides, there are there's tons of opportunity where the county can invest money and um, get more metric tons of CO2 offset. Uh, and so once that is achieved, we recommend the county to look into solar. Uh, once I agree with the priority. Level. I agree with the priority list. Yeah. So for next steps, I wanted to make sure that the Sustainability Commission could kind of see this information. If anything else comes to mind after we get offline, and, and for the folks that are going to be watching this recording afterwards, um, you're welcome to email me any comments that I can pass along to our architects um, and assessors. So um, next steps, we're not going to make the actual reports available yet right now it's just um this the draft the recording uh because this is draft information we are having several meetings with different groups within the county to kind of refine the results and make sure that we took into account what we needed to take into account um and but what i'd love for the sustainability commission to be thinking about is how does this information affect some of the work that we're going to be doing into the sustainability plan. It doesn't mean that we can't be ambitious with our goals, but because two thirds, as David pointed out in the chat, two thirds of our buildings are in fair to poor condition. And what does that mean for the results of the energy audit? Like maybe we don't do some of the energy assessments in the next year or two or some of that work because we're going to end up doing a major renovation of the building and we should incorporate it at that time. So I think there's um, the plan at this moment is in the proposed uh, capital improvement program for FY22. We are proposing a certain amount of funding to be able to take this information and build out a facility master plan so that we can decide exactly what is going to happen in all of the buildings in the next 10 years. And that is something the Sustainability Commission can also be an important part of to make sure that we get our uh, sustainability goals and, and plans and ideas into when we do that master plan. Um, so any other comments or, or questions to wrap up? Okay, then I would like to thank KCBA and Bureau of Veritas um, for doing the presentation today. Thank you so much. Um, and I will get back with the commission uh, and send you all the recording so that you can look at the individual pieces if you like to. Thank you, Dr. J. And thanks everybody here. It was a lot Thank of information to in a very short amount of time tonight. So I appreciate everybody hanging in there with us. Uh, but thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. For Thank, the you. Thank you, everyone. Take care.